chapter 2, 1 through 5, page 484 in the Pew Bible. This is what Isaiah, son of Amaz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of, of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations will nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. The New Testament lesson comes from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. In the Pew Bible, page 832. As we practice carefree prayer and Christ-like thinking, we are promised the peace of God and the God of peace. That was in Philippians chapter 4, 4 through 9, page 832 in the Pew Bible. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, pr present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard, of, heard from me, or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Please stand if you're able for the reading of the gospel. The gospel lesson comes from John chapter 1, verses 19 through 31, page 750 in the Pew Bible. John confesses he is neither Christ nor the prophet prophesied by Moses. When Jesus comes to him, John identifies Jesus as the Lamb of God, the Messiah. John chapter 1, 19 through 31, page 750 in the Pew Bible. Now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He said, no. He, he answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert. Make straight, way, make straight the way for the Lord. Now some Pharisees who, who had who had been sent questioned him. When, why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one, one you do not know. He is, he is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and, and said, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. You may be seated.
In our gospel lesson today, in John chapter 1, we have the uh, story of John being uh, introduced to us. The prologue of John's gospel introduces Christ as the Word of God, the living Word, and then we have John coming and baptizing. But what was notable about today's lesson is all the uh, representatives of the Jewish uh, temple authorities coming out to ask John who he was. John was making such a splash in the day's news. You know, if there would have been a CNN or, or the uh, internet headlines or whatever, all the media would have been out there descending on the Jordan River covering John. He was that big a sensation. People in many countries all around heard about him, not just in Judea and Jerusalem, but from all the countries around. They came out to him, and so they wanted to know who he was, this guy that just all of a sudden showed up preaching repentance and baptism which was for most people a new thing. And so in verses 19 through 28, we have this dialogue between John and the authorities. Who are you? You've made such a sensation, we want to know all about you. And of course, John deflected the attention away from himself. He just simply described himself according to Isaiah chapter 40. He has a voice in the wilderness uh, crying out, make way for the Lord. But one thing about uh, John and about these verses is that John shone like the stars. His lifestyle was so different. Now, we remember in Matthew and and the other Gospels, it talks about how he ate locusts and and wild honey. And and they're not a diet most of us would choose, Uh, but that's what he ate. But that wasn't the way he was different, although that was different too. But he he acted much like a prophet, The, the prophet would dress in rough clothing as John did. And so that much uh, stood him out a little bit. But his fervor, his zeal, the urgency of his preaching, these things also stood out so that John really stuck out like a sore thumb. And that's our calling too, not to necessarily stick out in an odd way, but to stand out like stars. Paul tells us to do all things without complaining and arguing so that you may shine like the stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life in Philippians 2. John was so outstanding at what he was doing, people everywhere noticed. And that's what we're called to be too. Notice in a good way. John was the forerunner of Christ, and we cannot be that. No one was that except John. But in a little way, we are a forerunner to those who have never heard, to those whom perhaps Christ is just a curse word. They may know nothing about who Jesus Christ is, and in that way, we too can be a forerunner of Jesus Christ in their life. We are called to be different. In 1 Peter, you are a chosen people, a holy generation, a royal priesthood called to serve the Lord, to bring forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into a wonderful light. And through so much of the Bible, not just John, the first chapter, but so much of the Bible, we're, we're the light because Jesus gives us light. 1 Peter in chapter 3 says, In your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. People will talk against us, but if we don't give them ammo... We don't have to say anything in return. If we live as Christ wants us to live, their words will come back upon them empty and with no effect because people will know what we stand for as we are outstanding in our witness, just as John was in his, as we are outstanding in our lifestyle, just as John was also. Our difference, like John, should be a difference that points people to Christ, instead of away from Christ. Ephesians chapter 4. And Paul taught this to all the churches that he visited, that he wrote. But in Ephesians, uh, again and again, he hammers this point home that our lifestyle uh, should, should be one that goes along with our words, the words that we preach. In Ephesians 4 verse 1, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And then later on, 
I tell you this and insist on it, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. And yet again in chapter 5, verse 8, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. Be different. Make a difference in the way that you live so that the words that you speak can have full effect. And in the Old Testament, even in Daniel, in the last chapter, after all the great visions he had seen, even, even seeing the Son of Man at the end of time, here is what the angel uh, told Daniel. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like stars forever and ever. We are called to light, as Jesus himself said in the Sermon on the Mount. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. In Matthew chapter 5. Therefore, let your good deeds uh, shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And so our goodness, our lives should be outstanding, as John's was, to point people to Jesus Christ. So we continue on in John chapter 1, the verses 29 and 30. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Proclaim Jesus to the world, not just with our lives, but also with our words. It's often been said that uh, St. Francis was once quoted as saying, Proclaim the gospel. If necessary, use words. It's a nice story. Nobody uh, really knows that St. Francis ever said that. But the, the point is well taken that our lives, again, and our words should go together. But we are called to use words. We're not called to just be silent witnesses. People are saved by what? The Word of God. What is it that creates faith? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of Christ. We are called to live our lives as a witness, but we are also called to speak God's word as a witness as well. God's word is the power to save. Paul in Romans says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. That's where the power lies, is in our words, which should reflect or which should proclaim God's word. The last thing Jesus said before he went to heaven is recorded in Acts chapter 1. And really, the Great Commission isn't absolutely the last thing he said, but this is. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Witnesses do what? They tell of what they've seen, of what they've heard, of what they know. There is no other name given under heaven by which salvation may be found, Peter later proclaimed in Acts chapter 4. And in, our, in John chapter 1, there was a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all people might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. And again, John is our supreme example of witnessing, not only by our lives, but also by our words. How important is that? In Matthew chapter 10, which uh, if you recognize that chapter, it's the chapter when Jesus gave instructions to his disciples to, to go out and preach how to win disciples. And in chapter 10, verse 32 and 33, Jesus says, Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. Confessing the name of Jesus Christ is part of our faith, part of what we teach people to do, to stand up for what we say we believe. And of course, the Great Commission itself, go make disciples baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. So, so much of our proclamation, so much of our life 
consists of our words, proclaim Jesus to all the world as John did. And in verse 31, John 1, verse 31, John said, I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. John tells why he came. He tells of his purpose of life, and that was to show who the Messiah was, to show the Messiah to Israel. Whatever we do, do it all to proclaim Jesus. Do all to the glory of God. Whatever we do and say should contribute to our gospel witness. Everything that we train ourselves to be should reflect the fact that we are God's people, that we are Christian, that we are little Christs in our world. 1 John 4, 17 makes the astounding statement, you are like Christ in this world. And as one saying, which songs have been written about, one saying says that you are Jesus to the people that you know. No one, you are the Bible that some people read. You are the hands of Christ and the feet of Christ to some people. It's far less important what you do for a living or your hobbies and all those things. doesn't really make a lot of difference, providing it's not illegal or immoral. But what is important is that whatever you do, you do it well. That whatever you do, you do it in such a way that it builds up the body of Christ, that it gives glory to God, that it is excellent and of good quality, that God will receive praise and not slander for the things you do and say. Paul glorified God by preaching Christ and him crucified. Barnabas did it by encouraging others. John the Baptist by preaching and baptizing. David did it by slaying Goliath and by conquering kingdoms. And Brother Lawrence, the famous saint who wrote, Practicing the Presence of God, glorified God by washing dishes. It doesn't matter what you're doing at the moment if you do it for the glory of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Verse 31, Paul brings that point home too. He says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Don't cause anyone to stumble. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And in Colossians chapter 3, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, Peter says, Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. God wants to bless all of us, and he does it through us primarily. The way we do things should be for God's glory. And so what does all this have to do with Christmas time? Here it is, the fourth Sunday in Advent, two days before Christmas. And many people are getting tired of Christmas, even though the day itself hasn't quite yet gotten here. What does John the Baptist have to do with Christmas? What does all this about our witness have to do with Christmas? But what better time to talk about how to live, who to be, how to witness, then Christmas time. We have the built-in opportunity to witness to Christ to people who don't know. Some people say, oh, I get so tired of going to the stores because all you hear is Christmas music, but that's the one time, others say, that one time that you can go to any store and hear the gospel being played in music form. The story is being told. Do we ever listen beyond the words? Many of the hymns are concluding with a, a verse that's actually a prayer. One of my favorite prayers, a prayer I pray practically every day, is actually the third verse from Away in a Manger. Be near me, Lord Jesus. I ask thee to stay close by me forever and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in your tender care and fit us for heaven to live with thee there. Christmas is a built-in opportunity to witness of, of who Christ is and what he does for us. What does he do for you?
Christmas, as we know, it's not primarily about Santa Claus and presents and Frosty the Snowman. It's that God became one of us so that people might become like him. God became a man, as the Orthodox sum up. God became a man so that men might become as God. As Galatians 4 said, when the time had fully come, I want to, <coughs> excuse me, when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights as sons. That's what Christmas is about. Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief, Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 1. That's what Christmas is all about. In John chapter 1, verses 14 through 17, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. That's what Christmas is about. And that gospel in a nutshell, the verse, probably the first verse most of us memorized. God loved the world so much that he sent his one and only son. He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's what Christmas is all about. And the Christmas gospel received from the angels as they gave the good news to the shepherds. The angel said to them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you in the town of David, a savior has been born. He is Christ the Lord. As Linus told Charlie Brown, that's what Christmas is all about. John the Baptist then shows us the way in many ways, but primarily at Christmas time, as at all times of the year. John teaches us to point others to Jesus because that's really what Christmas is all about. That's what life is all about. So shine like the stars in both word and deed and do everything to God's glory. In Jesus' name, amen.